There's the table of contents. Develop uh, elements of your developer reputation. So why do you care about your developer reputation? Hiring managers won't guess what you know, they only see what you show. And employers won't guess what you can do, they see only what you can demonstrate. And then what you take away from open source is not as important as what you give back. And really that's, those are the three main points I think of the entire, uh, you'll see how this sort of um, relates to everything else as we go through it. So elements of a developer reputation. We're gonna see this slide twice, once here, and then once sort of toward the end of this section and like the like the, the middle of the entire presentation where we, um, first we're gonna look at what it is and then we're gonna reevaluate what we have in light of this. So hiring managers are gonna look for what you have done, what you can do, and also whether you give back. What you've done, that's evidence of experience. That's your resume, which, you know, it's sort of uh, feels a little obsolete, but everybody needs a resume still nowadays. You need to have it. Um, your LinkedIn profile in some ways has uh, replaced your resume as the main thing that people look at. If you use your LinkedIn profile intelligently, then you can definitely, um, get a lot of mileage out of it, even more so than, than a well-crafted resume, because it gives you the opportunity to link directly to your previous employers who presumably also have a presence on LinkedIn. And then if a hiring manager is looking at that, they can click through that, they can see the website that you worked on, they can see who else works at the company, they can see the person that was your manager and they can write to them directly for a reference. They don't need to ask you for a reference. It's all connected. It's all wonderful on LinkedIn. If you fill it out right, if you really do a good job with your profile. Then portfolio websites. I'm always a big fan of people setting up portfolio websites. And it doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, if you're going for a Drupal job, you don't need to have a Drupal website. If it's a WordPress job, you don't need to have a WordPress website. If you're going for a Laravel job or a, a Symfony job or a um, Spring Boot MVC job, you don't necessarily need to use the, <laughs> the same um, platform for your website. But it does help to have something online that shows that you know how to publish something online and that functions as a portfolio of work that you've done up to this point. Now, if you've got project links really um, are, are kind of, uh, we'll get into more detail later. I, I guess I'll just read <laughs> the table of contents. But basically, if, if you've got um, things that are live now that, that you built, you should link to them directly. Um, if they are live, but they're not on the public internet, sometimes you make a site and it's only behind a VPN on a private corporate screenshot of it and include that with a description of what you did. Or if it used to be online and it's not online anymore, then hopefully you've gone to archive.org while it was live and you've got a snapshot of it or someone else has if you didn't <laughs> try to do it. So all those things are evidence of your experience. Then you got evidence of skills, code samples and public repos. Um, there's the usual suspects, GitHub, GitLab, and Bitbucket, which I always mention, and also git.drupalcode.org, which is Drupal specific, and you get the opportunity to log into that with your um, drupal.org account if you make one of those. If you don't have code samples that are full, uh, you know, then you can just have snippets that are just little pieces of code that kind of do something interesting, but they don't really stand alone as like an app or a site. And very often you see these in these code playgrounds, like CodePen, JS Fiddle, JS Bin, CSS Deck, Code Sandbox, Glitch. All of these are active links if you, uh, I'll just mouse over it, but they're all active links. And if you download, I'll make sure I upload a PDF of the slides and also we can link to the slides on, um, on the uh, beautiful, AI platform. So all of these are worth taking a look at. I'm not going to get too in depth about any of them. And then uh, demo apps are mostly important if you don't have any websites, <laughs> but you just want to be something that um, that shows you can code something uh, and and that uh, it looks good and it, it functions. Um, that's very helpful for people when you're looking to get your first 
job and you don't have any professional work that is in your portfolio yet. Those are all evidence of your skills. And then there's the community contribution. Um, if you've contributed, if you have released software that other people are using, open source software projects like Composer or NPM packages, Drupal modules, WordPress plugins, all these things, uh, hiring managers love this. They can um, download the code and see if it runs. They can look at the source code online because it's open source. They can really evaluate whether you code um, to the standards and, uh, and, and follow the best practices and, and your code is secure and it's well commented. And it's, you know, the type of code that they're looking for someone to be able to make. Or you could contribute sometimes to open source in, um, in less substantial ways rather than having an entire project that you maintain. Maybe you've just contributed patches to other people's projects or you haven't written patches, but you've contributed bug reports. You show, oh, this broke and I have a good idea why maybe someone else can write a patch. Um, and in the Drupal world, those are called issue queues on, on the project uh, page at drupal.org. Then there's online communities. You can participate in these. Exchange, Quora. This is kind of a partial list of something I'll go in more detail later, but primarily these are question and answer forums, although Drupal.org is a special case. You can also do blog writing or presenting like me at this lunch and learn today or uh, speaking opportunities at conferences um, and different, different forms of networking. And all of these things can enhance your developer reputation. So let's talk about project links. What are project links? That's something that you did. <laughs> it's professional web development work that you made for a client and it's published on the public internet. Now, I used this slide before and you'll see uh, if you go back to the uh, how to succeed in technical screening. Um, but basically there are some edge cases. Maybe you've done professional software design for a client, but it's not a website. Maybe it's a mobile or desktop app or something else. If that's the case, um, good on you if you've actually published a Android app to the Google Play Store or a iOS app that's in the Apple App Store. Those are great things and you can link to those and I can at least take a look at it whether or not I actually have, you know, desire to uh, actually download it or purchase it and, and put it on my phone. Maybe if it's a free app, I'll just throw it on my phone. <laughs> um, or maybe you've uh, done professional software design, but it's not public facing. As I mentioned before, it could be on a private network and maybe you need to be on a VPN to see it or something else. Or it's not online anymore, but if that's the case, then it may be archived at web.archive.org and I will mouse over that. That is also an active link. I'm not gonna bother going to it. I think that sometimes when I go over time, it's because I follow every active link in the slide. So I'll circle back to some of these if I um, have time to fill at the end. But the uh, Internet Archive has this wonderful service. If you go to web.archive.org, then you can search for any web URL and it's going to tell you whether other people have already archived it or if nobody's ever archived it, you can archive it yourself right then. Then there's other edge cases where it's like, I haven't done any professional work yet. I know how to code, but I just haven't had clients, you know, um, but maybe I've built my own website for my blog, my band or some other project, or I've built a bunch of demo apps in a coding bootcamp. And uh, these can be published online and they can be very useful in terms of having links that you can send people to for evidence of your skills. So evaluating project links, you should be prepared to do this yourself before you send it out because reviewers may use some of the following techniques. They may view the link in different browsers or they may view it on phone or tablet to test for responsive design. What I like to do sometimes is I like to just um, resize the screen and make it very narrow and then gradually make it wider to make sure that it looks good at every width. You know, um, They'll click around the site to test its functionality, see what it does. If it's something you can log on to or make a um, make a test account, they may make an account with it and see what it, put it through its paces. If there's some kind of an e-commerce functionality, they might even buy a product from you <laughs> um, or from your employer. Um, and they may validate the HTML or CSS to make sure that you did a good job with that, that you've got good 
you know, and um, they may use browser plugins. We've got a lot of these, uh, which are kind of like a little um, magic magnifying glass. You can kind of look under the skin of the site and see what tech stack is used, or at least make a educated guess as to what the tech stack is. It's not always, um, it's certainly not always right. Um, and they may also test accessibility. Sorry, I, I, I had focused on the wrong thing when I clicked. They, they, all, they may also test um, accessibility for WCAG, for um, 508 compliance and uh, color contrast, um, navigability with uh, text-to-speech, JAWS or NVDA, um, voiceover on the Mac, Orca on Linux, if anybody uses that. So all of these things are um, are definitely things that you want to test yourself before you send it out, especially if you know that the job description is going to um, require uh, any of this stuff, if it requires responsive design, if it requires um, accessibility. You want to make extra effort to test those things before you um, before you link to it and send it out for your potential future employers to evaluate. Now let's take a look at your code samples. Let's boost your code samples. What is a code sample? Now hiring managers don't expect you to share secret stuff. This is a common misconception. People will come to us and they'll say, I can't share a code sample. All of my code is proprietary. And I can say, we get that. We don't want you to share any of that stuff. And if you did share it, we would send it back because we can't show it to our clients. They don't want to see something that you're not supposed to share. That is actually a red flag. They won't hire you, you know? But that is why they do expect you to provide public code samples that are released under an open source license, such as the GNU GPL or the MIT license, BSD license, Apache license, there's a million of them. Or just in the public domain, maybe you didn't even bother to put a license file in the repo. Do's, write your own original code, implement custom business logic, which is like your code has to do something. Show that you can code to platform APIs. If it's a Drupal module, there's Drupal APIs. If it's a WordPress mod, uh, plugin or whatever. Um, or if it's uh, something else, you're, you're dealing with C-sharp or .NET, or you're dealing with uh, Java, and, and um, you're dealing with uh, Python and Django. You, know? you want to code to the platform APIs and you want to follow established standards and best practices so that if we run code validators or sniffers or linters on your code, it's not going to show that there's a whole bunch of errors with it. But don't turn in a plagiarized assignment. I've seen this. Um, sometimes I get the same thing over and over from different people. and. A, like a code comment at the top of it and I'll Google it and I'll find it somewhere else online in somebody else's repo or whatever. It's like, okay, it does show that you understand the assignment, but it also shows that you kind of didn't put too much thought and creativity into it. You know, you should not turn in a plagiarized assignment. It doesn't have to be from work stuff, but you should come up with something that does something. It can be simple. Um, don't share proprietary code that's in violation of a non-disclosure agreement. Never share code that reveals personally identifiable information, that's PII. Anything that's protected under HIPAA or FERPA, you know, or any, any of these privacy regulations, um, you definitely don't want to do that. And you don't want to share code that reveals API keys or authentication credentials that are used in a client's production environment. If you did any of these things, even if the code is absolute genius, you're gonna have your hiring manager looking askance at you and saying, I, I don't know if I can hire this person. They, they're a great coder, but there's, I question their judgment. <laughs> you know? But let's talk about your GitHub profile. This was actually the first thing <laughs> that, uh, that gave us the idea when Matt Pritchard and I were talking about what, what, what we should do for the next Lunch and Learn. Um, you can use GitHub pages to host a static portfolio site for free or for the price of DNS. If you're using a custom domain, that can be like 10 bucks a year. Do create a stunning GitHub profile README. And I kind of, I feel like I, oh, I'm just going to do it. Let's see if I can open that in a new uh, window. This is an article about how to create a GitHub profile readme, and it's got a video and everything. 
totally great. Um, but these things are awesome. They're new as of 2020. Um, you have to make a special repo, um, which has the same name as your GitHub profile. And when you do that, it says, okay, this is a special repository. It's readmeMD will appear on your public profile. And then you can do all kinds of cool stuff with it. You can add all these icons or add these widgets that show your GitHub stats and do all kinds of cool tricks with it. So I'm highly recommended that you do that. I'm just gonna close that. And uh, if you do, this is another great um, <laughs> suggestion. I did this for a little while. Just make your New Year's resolution or whatever to uh, commit at least one line of code to GitHub. It really doesn't have to be a high impact thing, but as long as you do a little bit every day. And then of course, when you're working on something, you might be doing 50 lines of code or hundred lines of code or 500 lines of code that day or whatever. Um, and uh, if you do it every day for a year, then your profile contribution graph will look amazing. Now I did it for a year. It wasn't from January to January. So if I show you this, you'll see where it tapers off, but um, this is gonna be my skyline. You guys can see this. That is my profile contribution graph from 2020. And you can grab this thing and you can move it around. It's like a virtual reality thing, you know? And each of these corresponds to a day of the week and, you know, um, the 52 weeks of the year. And you can see some days I did a lot more work than others. It looks like a cool cityscape with all these uh, skyscrapers in it. And I love it. But that's not, I feel like I didn't, um, probably should have, uh, <laughs> probably should have used, here we go. Is this their back button? There we go. It opened it in a new tab, so there we go. And also contribute to other open source projects on GitHub, that's for free. That's just like you get flair. <laughs> if you've seen Office Space, you know you have to wear your pieces of flair, but um, you'll get these cool um, logos and icons and stuff in your GitHub profile that show other organizations that you've contributed to their uh, software. And, and that's great. Don't do this, don't publish a lot of unfinished projects that don't do anything, then when the hiring manager gets there, they're going to be like, oh, you've got 350 GitHub repos, but none of them are relevant to the job. And I don't have the time of day to go clicking through them and figure out which one I'm supposed to be looking at. Um, at least if you've got 350 unfinished things, then at least just pin a couple of good ones, you know, in your top six there, so that I know what to look at or, um, or tell me. Uh, uh, like a direct link to a specific repo that I should be looking at. Oh, that is your Laravel, you know, or that is your Symfony or whatever it is. You know? um, that goes a long way. And don't publish projects without a pretty good idea. It's okay. It's going to be like, oh man, this is like NPM or Yarn or something. I'm going to try and spin it up. Oh, it's throwing errors. It's the wrong version of this. It's old. It's obsolete. It's not going to start. I don't know what to do. It's great to have all of your project dependencies bundled if you can with Docker so that you've um, actually pinned the version of everything uh, using something like Lando or DDEV or uh, Doxel or just using Docker Compose. I highly recommend that you do that with your, um, with your Git repos. But if you don't do that, then at least do me the favor of publishing a readme that says how to start, how to build it and start it and what the dependencies are. If it depends on some weird version of Ruby, that's an old version and I'm gonna need to try and figure that out. Let me know, you know, um, don't, leave it to me to figure it out. I'm not going to spend more than a half an hour trying to get your program to run. And if it doesn't run, I'm not going to consider it a very useful, um, you know, I may be able to eyeball it, but it's not the same as, uh, as something that I can actually build and run that works and does something cool. Let's talk about your portfolio site. Let's boost your portfolio site. So, I reused this slide from the last thing as well, but it's the Holy Grail to me is a portfolio website. It combines so much stuff. It's a lot of the same stuff that you can get in your LinkedIn. And it's a lot of the same stuff that you can um, give me project links uh, or, or, um, or demo apps um, or link to different GitHub repositories. You can have this all organized in your portfolio website. And let's take a look at why 
they're so great. Um, we're looking for project links that show regular activity up to the present. We're not really looking for a portfolio website that you made 10 years ago that has your old sites up till 2010 or 2011 and it doesn't have anything new. That's not great. Um, if your sites are private or if they're archived, um, well, if they're private, I'd like to see screenshots and I'd like to see um, like a description of, of what you did for the site. Uh, or if it's no longer online, it's great if you can link to an archive or at least have a screenshot of it and, and a description. Also demo apps, if you've got them, a lot of people will put these up in the early days when they first put up their portfolio website and then they kind of move down, you know, or onto a back page and they're no longer on the front page of the site. Um, once you've got a portfolio of actual client work and that kind of comes center stage. What makes a bad one? Lack of project links, vague descriptions. I actually had somebody who said, I had several clients, including nonprofits. Um, and they said this <laughs> for various periods that were like every six months for several years, they said the same vague description. <laughs> uh, so I knew that they kind of were lying about something. Also, if there's a lack of recent projects, it makes it look like your best years are behind you and you haven't really done any work lately. So it's good to keep it fresh and, um, and try to, you know, Keep, you, keep your saw blades sharp, keep, keep in there. <laughs> um, maybe you're doing more of something else nowadays. You're doing more project managing. You're not doing as much coding. I mean, that's fair. Or if there's gaps in your resume for some other reason, you went back to college or something, you know, like, I don't know, could be anything, but those things don't necessarily work against you, but it is great. Like the best candidates are the ones that have like a sort of upward career trajectory. When they come to me, it's like, okay, you did some junior stuff. You did some mid-level stuff. It looks like you're ready for a senior role. You know, um, that's the best. I mentioned this before, but you don't need to put up a Drupal site just because you're looking for a Drupal job. You can use a static site. And we call this now the, the uh, buzzword is Jamstack. This is for JavaScript APIs. Markdown is the original um, acronym for Jamstack. But the term has come to encompass a lot of different tools that are sort of static site generators that might hook up to a data source, whether it's a RESTful API or a GraphQL API or something like that. or um, in some cases, it hooks up to a database, but then it just generates a static site to a special directory. And, um, and then you can just take the static HTML and CSS and JavaScript that's made by the generator, and you can host it somewhere. I mean, literally, you can host things on GitHub pages or Netlify for free forever until the company goes out of business. Um, the only caveat with Netlify and GitHub pages is that if you want it to be at your domain, like my site is at hotwebmatter.com, then uh, if you want it to be at your domain, then you have to um, pay for uh, domain registration. And I'm not sure if GitHub offers DNS, but Netlify does. It's an uh, accredited DNS registrar. It's, it's accredited by ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. So you can buy your domain from them for like 10 or 15 bucks a year or whatever. And then you can have just a, a GitHub repo or GitLab or Bitbucket, wherever your Git is, and have it just um, build that site in a pipeline and, and spit it out on Netlify. And GitHub pages, same way. Um, that started out with uh, Jekyll, which is, um, it's it's made out of mostly Ruby and some YAML and some JavaScript, but um, but it's a Ruby based implementation and GitHub Pages was born to support Jekyll in the first place. But you can do a lot of other things with it. There's um, there's Hugo, which is very very popular nowadays. It's in the programming language Go, which is from Google and it has a very good reputation. I haven't used it. There's um, Gatsby and Next.js are React-based static site generators. They are consistently in the top. In fact, the, the list that you're seeing here, starting with Next.js, then Hugo, then Gatsby, then Jekyll, then Nuxt, which is not Next. It's sort of the, the view uh, version of Next. Like Next.js goes with React, and Nuxt is built on Vue. Um, but these are the top uh, six on this 
list of generators. And I will go ahead and click on that. This is the Jamstack um, website. And it explains all about what is the Jamstack, why Jamstack, why, why do you want to do it in the first place? What is it all about? But it also has this great little list of just, I mean, Uh, you can you know, 333. There's 333 different static site generators here. You can pick your favorite language if you want it to be in, you know, uh, C++, C sharp. You know, if, if you code in F sharp, I have not. Uh, <laughs> all these things are in here, and there's static site generators built in. Look, Perl. Perl is still around. Awesome. I used to do Perl back in the 90s. So. Um, this is worth taking a look at, and there is a link to it in the uh, in the presentation. I'm going to exit full screen so I can close the tab, and then I'm going to go back into full screen. Highly recommended that you use one of these static site generators to make a portfolio website. And there are tons of open source templates out there. If you just Google for it, just ask for whatever platform you've picked, you want to do Gatsby or you want to do um, Jekyll or whatever. And you, you, you pick one out and then you're going to Google for portfolio templates. And there are a million of them. And in fact, my own um, website, uh, I, I used a, an open source Jekyll template, which I occasionally, sometimes a candidate will come to me and I'll see that come back to me in the wild. Um, but I also made sure that as an open source software user and advocate, I also, when I made changes that improved that template, I contributed them back upstream. And I have contributed several times to that template. And that's in my, that's reflected in my Git, GitHub repo. So enough about static sites. Let's talk about your public profiles. I think this is the real meat of the thing, auditing your public profiles. So what's a public profile? These are your profiles on various social platforms. They're published on the public internet. They should link back to your portfolio site or contain project links. Your LinkedIn profile is the big one. It is your de facto resume. And in some cases, it's even more important than a docx or PDF or paper resume. Um, then if you do Drupal, and not everybody does Drupal, but a lot of people at Esteem do Drupal. And uh, if you are looking for a Drupal role, very often you will not get a callback from the hiring manager if you don't have a Drupal.org profile. So everybody, if you don't have one, go get one now if you're interested in a Drupal role. You know, get, get one right away. And then whenever you um, encounter a problem with Drupal or a bug, use that account to go and check the issue queues and participate in the issue queues, file bug reports, see if you can make a patch and contribute the patch. If you're lucky, then your patch gets merged to the upstream developers uh, project, and then that's credited right in your profile. It's all automatic. Drupal.org is unique in, in the um, free software world and the way that they keep track of all of your contributions, code and community non-code contributions are all um, automatically cataloged in your Drupal.org profile. So that's really great. You also can consider source code version control services to be public profiles. Um, you might think they're code samples, but like your GitHub account is not a code sample. And even if you have 333 repos in your GitHub, um, profile, you may not have any code samples in there that a hiring manager is looking for something relevant. So um, code samples have to show that you can implement business logic by coding to APIs. So you could have a lot of repos and none of them are code samples uh, that, that your future employer is looking for. And again, the big three are GitHub, GitLab, and Bitbucket. I'm also including git.drupalcode.org because if you do have a Drupal.org profile, that's connected to git.drupalcode.org. And there's a way with a little bit of configuration that you can generate an SSH key and you can use that with your Git and you can, helps you to, uh, helps you to grab other people's projects when you wanna test them locally and when you wanna make patches and send that back upstream. Um, and it also helps you if you ever have your own project that you want to publish, um, that's gonna be, that other people can, when they're 
composer installing their Drupal project. They can composer install Drupal slash my module. You know, that's that's really amazing. Um, but let's talk about LinkedIn a little bit more. Uh, I'm going to give credit where credit's due. It's always good not to plagiarize. And the tips below are quoted from this YouTube video, which I've linked to, and you can even see it on the screen if you want to make a note of it. Uh, this guy, Bryant Tunbutter, is very entertaining. He calls himself the uh, Kim Kardashian of software developers because he has something like, I don't know, 17,000 followers on LinkedIn or something. Um, and he, his recommendations are to land your first job in tech, which is the hardest, you know, you got to get your foot in the door. Once you have experience, you'll get hired. But before you have experience, and they'll be like, oh, it's an entry level role requires three years experience. Why? You know, and I have great candidates lined up. At, oh, they went to coding boot camps. And we don't want to interview them. They don't have enough experience yet to be a junior dev. I just don't get it. But his advice is golden. He says, get to 500 plus connections. I'm not even there yet. I'm a little shy of that. He says, connect with technical recruiters, including uh, Bianca and Rachel from uh, Esteemed. Um, and then you can, in your profile, you set the green open to work badge. That lets everybody know that you're looking and make your headlines are going to goose up your engagement on LinkedIn. Um, you know, make sure that when people try to contact you on there, you engage with them and talk to them. And, uh, you know, and, and connect with them if you, if you want to get 500 plus connections. Um, do look out, uh, you know, some people are just scamming on there or they have their own agenda and maybe you don't want to be friends with them forever. But generally speaking, LinkedIn, it's okay to befriend a lot of people and it works uh, to your advantage. So what are some other public profiles? There's QA forums like Stack Overflow or Stack Exchange. Um, there's Quora, which is a whole website just dedicated to asking questions about absolutely anything at all. And people can answer them and rate each other's answers. And then there's Reddit, which is kind of a little bit more free form and also is a little bit of a melting pot of everything that humanity has to offer. They definitely have some good tech forums. Um, they definitely have, um, you know, Drupal and WordPress and other things are well represented on there. Linux, whatever things you're, you know, Mac, whatever things you're into. Um, then the code playgrounds, as I mentioned earlier, um, when you don't have enough code yet for it to be a full app, but you just want to be able to show, oh, I can do this cool thing with CSS or I can do this cool thing with JavaScript, then code playgrounds are a great way to show these things. CodePen, JS Fiddle, JS Bin, CSS Deck, despite the name, it also allows JavaScript. Um, Code Sandbox, uh, Glitch, I think got bought by another service, but it still is the same sort of thing. Also design sharing sites, which aren't really code playgrounds. They're more like, um, like portfolios of little, um, of just images that are screenshots of things. And very often UX specialists, UX designers will use these to show their uh, wireframes and, and kind of um, their design process. So Behance and there are other ones. Um, I don't really look at them too much. I'm generally, even for front end, I'm generally looking for the code. <laughs> but, uh, but these things are good. Um, and if I, if I run across a candidate who has them, they certainly, you're not penalized for having um, uh, design sharing or thumbnail sharing like that. And then also social media services. I'm throwing this in there just because if you don't make your Insta private, then you run the risk that a hiring manager might look at it, whether or not you really use it for work. I personally, I don't look at Facebook and Instagram unless I have no other public profiles. If, if I can't find GitHub, you know, they're applying for a Drupal role, they don't have a Drupal.org account, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking for anything uh, that, that's going to be work related and I can't find anything about this person except for their Facebook page, then I might hazard a look at it. And sometimes it's even got something kind of tech related in it now, rarely. Um, but just be aware that if you've got personal stuff that's really just for you and your friends or you're joking about things that might be inappropriate for work um, or, you know, you're tweeting about things uh, using salty language or whatever, then, you know, I mean, well, a certain amount of profanity, I suppose, can be uh, 
excused in 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 the modern uh, era, but I, I it's not your social media have anything offensive in it, right? Because these things may be evaluated by the hiring managers if they're public. They're not necessarily. I might take a look at them, and if I see something that I think another hiring manager might not like. I'm going to warn you <laughs> to shut it down um, before someone else sees it, rather than saying you can't get work with the steam. But it's just good to uh, kind of keep that stuff in mind. Now we're back to that wonderful three column. Uh, I, I talked about this earlier, but we're back to it. And now we're looking at it again with the benefit of hindsight. There's still a little bit more ahead, but we're, we're in the home stretch. Um, but we're looking back at our profiles uh, to see, do they answer these questions? What have you done? What can you do? And do you give back? So for evidence of experience, ask yourself, do I describe my role at each employer? Do I discuss the tech stack and the tools used? Do I include project links if the sites are still live, um, if they're on the public internet? Or if they're not on the public internet and they're private, do I have a screenshot and a description of what my role was in the tech stack that I used? And if the site is no longer online, do I link to an archive of it at, at web.archive.org? Then what can you do? Ask yourself about your evidence of skills. Are you providing evidence of skills that in, in a way that it's obvious to an impartial viewer, a casual viewer, that, you know, can a potential employer verify your ability to implement business logic by coding to APIs? Again, business logic, that just means it does something. Coding to APIs, that just means using Drupal as my most common example. If it's for Drupal, then it should demonstrate some Drupal APIs like, you know, I'd like to see the form API. I'd like to see that you can implement a block plugin class. I'd like to see that you understand um, yeah, um, like class-based, uh, you know, dependency injection, and um, and and all, all of the things that you that you're gonna expect. To, you know, route routing, or, or um, you know, route controllers, or uh, service classes, things like this. You know, and I want to be able to see that you know the APIs and that you can code to them. Does your public code adhere to standards and follow best practices? This includes like, is it secure? Um, does it sanitize inputs? Uh, it also just includes things like, are things indented properly? You can just run a linter on it. You can just have that. You can have your, you can set up your IDE, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, whether you're using PHP Storm or, or uh, VS Code or whether you're just using something like VI, you know, you can set it up. So, you know, Vim certainly can be set up to automatically indent stuff for you. Um, or if you don't do that, you can have, you can lint it before, you can make a Git hook so that you lint it before you commit it and make sure that it's all clean code. Do your code repos have a readme.md file that explains how to build the project? So frustrating when they don't. And then you're looking at a half broken project and it just doesn't work, you know? And do your code repos link to functioning demo apps in production online? And then ask yourself whether you give back. Have you made public contributions to open source code? Have you opened issue queues or filed bug reports? Have you written documentation, blog posts, tutorials, videos? All these things are very, very um, valuable to establish you as not only um, to show your expertise and your skills, but also to sort of establish you as a, as a thought leader, somebody who's, you know, the tech is changing all the time, a new version of uh, whatever platform comes out and we all have to learn how it works. And when we figure it out, do we rush out to tell everyone, hey, I figured it out, here's how you do it. Um, People that can do that are prized in digital agencies because they're the people who are the senior developers who can help to onboard junior developers and help to bring people up to speed with the new technologies. And also, do you answer questions in forums? Of course, it can be just as valuable to ask smart questions or to file bug reports, even if you don't um, solve the bug and, and contribute the patch. But even better if you're the person who files the bug report with the patch, you know, wow, you know, I, I figured it out. Here's the solution for everybody else. I'm giving back to the community. 
these things are just the, priceless. Um, it's that it's the attitude and the mindset of somebody who's a real somebody who is grateful to the open source community for giving us the tools that we use to make so much money and to uh, you know um, support our livelihood. So if we've got a couple of hours to give back to it, we certainly will give back to the community. Now, speaking of the community, how can we boost our developer community? I was talking a little bit about Q&A communities. Um, Drupal.org has the project issue queues. Stack Overflow and Stack Exchange, it's all the same company, but um, Stack Overflow is the main one. And then Stack Exchange is like an, another 150 or more um, different channels for different specific special interests like the Drupal Answers Stack Exchange, which is drupal.stackexchange.com or whatever. And WordPress development is wordpress.stackexchange. You know. Uh, these things are super valuable to, um, to contribute to, and I actually encourage everybody, especially if you work for esteemed, go ahead and make a public account with that too. That's almost as good as the Drupal.org one. And next time you got a question that you want to bring to us in our uh, esteemed colleagues community and you want to bring it to Slack, post it on there first. Um, I'll try and answer it in Slack, and then I'll put the answer on the Stack Exchange so that it doesn't get erased after a month because we're still using a free Slack for our, for our colleagues platform. For the time being, we're working on something else. <laughs> um, but that's great, right? And then also you can get, uh, you can get points for that and you, people will see that activity when they come um, and you can link to that as one of your public profiles and uh, your hiring manager is gonna look and see, oh, you've been asking smart questions or even better, you've been answering questions. Then Quora and Reddit, I think I've already said as much as I want to say about those, but they're both valuable, potentially very valuable, um, that uh, if, if you're answering questions and if that's to your uh, developer profile as well. Now, what else can you do in the developer community? You can write blog posts, documentation, tutorials. You can participate in discussions, not just Q&A forums, but um, you know, sometimes just uh, like, like live uh, chats with people on platforms like Slack or Discord or uh, Matrix or Mattermost. You can attend events physically or virtually. You can become a speaker like me today, I'm giving a presentation and you can do this. You could do a lunch and learn for esteemed. If you feel like you're a subject matter expert about something, you could definitely do one of these. We'll record it. We'll put it on YouTube with your name on it. And then you can link to that and say, look what I did guys. And that's going to help you get a job. Or you can just network with the other members. Um, certainly. And it, it, when you go to these events, if it's like a conference or a, um, or a camp, uh, that's that's dedicated to a specific technology, you're going to see a lot of people there who work for the digital agencies that you might want to work for, and you get to meet them and, uh, in, you know, assign a face to that name and, and uh, make a connection, and they'll get to meet you and think, oh, this is a person who's interesting, who's passionate about something, who I could see them being an asset to our team. That goes a long way, and we might get a job. So amplify your voice. Um, Think about what things you've learned this year. If it's brand new emerging technology, the brand new version just came out, you know, um, oh, there's a new bug in the very latest version of, of Drupal and, uh, and I worked on it and I figured it out or I did something kind of crazy with Layout Builder um, because it's still got some rough edges and, and people are still trying to figure that out. And I can write an article about it. Or if it's something else that you're an expert on, you know, you've got your own take on um, agile uh, projects with, um, you know, continuous integration, continuous development with uh, test driven development, you know, you can write an article about that. And, you know, to, I, I'm not the one but talk to the other Matt, uh, Matthew Pritchard, and um, you could, you know, we, we can hire you, we pay people to, to write for our blog. Or if you have ever worked for a digital agency that has their own blog, a lot of them do, um, then if you've written an article that's on, you know, like uh, 
I'm trying to think of agencies that have blogs where I see cool uh, articles all the time, Lullabot or uh, Media Current, Oomph, um, you know, they're out there and, uh, and, and they, they definitely will publish things about WordPress or Drupal that have interesting tips or interesting tutorials right on their own digital agency blog, which they use to drive SEO to their site. Um, that's, if you've got that, that, that shows that like you worked at a place that valued you as a contributor to their organization so much that they trusted you to write an article and represent their expertise um, on their own um, domain. You know, that's great. There's also these, um, you know, like Medium, Hashnode, uh, Dev.to, Ghost, their platforms, some of them are paywalled, some of them are free. Um, they're just platforms that are tuned for you to have a personal blog that you, you know, sometimes you get it for free, or if in the case of Medium or Ghost, I think you uh, have the option of paying like uh, five bucks or something to get a paywall on it so people have to they only get to read a certain number of articles for free and then if they read your article you can get tipped out after that or it's kind of a i don't know yeah i think you have to you have to get a lot of hits to make any money doing that and i personally am not a big fan of paywalls i'm a big fan of open uh you know information wants to be free kind of uh hacker ethic but um but Certainly these things are good. Or if you have your own personal website. Now, this is a little different from anything else because I didn't get into this. Hosting a real website that is going to be um, like a full CMS-based website that's Drupal or WordPress or some kind of MBC, like whether that's, uh, you know, uh, Python and Django or Ruby on Rails or it's something like, um, uh, I, I mentioned, I think, um, Java and Spring Boot MVC, or, um, you know, uh, there's, there's so many different ones that actually have to have not just like uh, a server, whether it's Apache or Nginx that supports like a, a, a programming language, or in, in the case of uh, Java, it might be Tomcat or whatever. That's also Apache, but it's a different server. Um, you know, and then you also have to have some kind of data store. And then you, you know, it's a full server. So, You have to host it on something like um, Linode or DigitalOcean, or you might use, if it's Drupal or WordPress, you might use something like Pantheon, or if it's Drupal, certainly um, Acquia is probably the fanciest hosting of all. It's, it comes straight from the people who build Drupal, you know, so um, uh, all of these things are different choices for full hosting, or you could use different, um, like there's these shared hosting services like DreamHost or whatever, or you could get, you know, uh, I mean, there's so many different options. I don't want to even get into it because it'll take up a whole presentation of its own. But if you do have your own personal website, that's like a full stack website of your, of your chosen tech stack that you're trying to get hired in, um, then certainly if you have your own blog on there and you have really smart articles about stuff, that, that counts in your favor. Um, I even count it in your favor if it used to be online. It's not online anymore, and I can find it in the uh, web archive at uh, web.archive.org. And I, I, if I find old articles from like, you know, you wrote something in 2005 about Drupal, I'm like, wow, they were really passionate about this all the way back then. That counts for something, as long as you also keep your skills fresh and you're staying up to date with stuff and we can put you to work on modern things that people are building now. Or there's speaking opportunities, you know, the esteemed lunch and learn. Again, I'm not the person to talk to, but Matt Pritchard can book you uh, an opportunity to do exactly what I'm doing today, a slideshow and a lecture and, and be the subject matter expert and talk to people about that. There's tons of tech conferences and camps depending on what your niche is. And you can attend these things remotely, which I have done uh, ever since the onset of the pandemic back in 2019, I've started going to so many remote events, you know, and I find that I, I do more traveling now <laughs> than I ever did. The country and sometimes even, I don't think I really have gone to anything overseas yet, but I'll consider that. So that pretty much wraps it up. Uh, any questions? How's your developer reputation? Has anybody got a question for me. I'm going to try to bring your, um, let me see if I can bring the
questions to the front and look at the Zoom thing. 